It is an honor for me, a real honor, to introduce Hubie Jones to you this evening. I've been reading about him for many, many years, and I'm sure that many of you have also, in newspaper articles and some of his op-ed pieces that have appeared in the Globe. I've also seen him on TV being interviewed or appearing on various panel discussions, as I'm sure most of you have, but this is the first time that I've ever been able to say, how do you do? Mr. Jones has been described as a man who has played a key role in the formation, rebuilding, and leadership of at least 30 organizations within the black community and across Boston. He truly understands the meaning of community. He received his undergraduate degree from CCNY and his master's degree in social work from Boston University. He served BU as professor and dean of the School of Social Work from 1977 to 1993, and then he was Chancellor for Urban Affairs at UMass Boston from 1995 until his retirement at the end of 2002. At UMass, among many other things, he created the Forum for the 21st Century to provide public, to provide public discourse on economic and social challenges facing the city, and there are a few. And he also helped to create the City to City program, which takes Boston leaders to other cities in the United States and abroad to learn from their leaders about their successful enterprises. He has served on numerous nonprofit boards in the greater Boston area. I'm not going to list them for you. He stepped in as acting president of Roxbury Community College when that organization was in some sort of a crisis. And he was director of the Community Fellows Program at MIT. The list of affiliations and accomplishments goes on, and he told me I was to be brief, but I didn't know what I could cut out. But I must mention one final thing. In anticipation of the dedication of the Leonard Zakem Bunker Hill Bridge, Mr. Jones led in the creation of the Boston Bridge Festival Chorus, which was extraordinary, multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and multi-racial. I hope many of you were there or else you saw it on TV when it was happening. I happened to be watching at the airport in Manchester, New Hampshire, where I was waiting for a plane that morning, and I must confess that I was completely undone by the music and by the visual image which I continue to hold in my heart. Uh, Hubie Jones, I'm still clutching. <laughs> Hubert Jones uh, will speak this evening on Black in Boston, a five-decade retrospective. And I understand there may be a book in the works. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My challenge tonight is to present a review of race relations in Boston since 1950. Obviously, in the time permitted, a comprehensive history is not possible. This is basically the framework for the book I am writing with the working title, Black in Boston, A Lover's Quarrel. A five-decade cursory sweep is a bit much, so hang on for the ride. On January 2nd, 1950, John B. Hines was inaugurated as the new mayor of Boston. He won election after a bit of political race filled with verbal vituperation against James Michael Curley, Boston's infamous rogue politician who held Boston politics in his grip for nearly 40 years. While Curley was in the federal penitentiary for mail fraud in 1947, Hines, then Boston City Clerk and a professional bureaucrat, served as acting mayor through a deal fashioned by City Hall and the state legislature. After serving time for five months, Curley returned and rudely pushed Hines aside and publicly berated him, berated his performance as temporary mayor. This harsh treatment enraged Hines and set him on a course to challenge Curley in the 1949 mayor's race. The election of John B. Hines marked a monumental break 
with the political management culture of Curley's long reign. Curley practiced a colorful brand of bread and butter patronage politics, laced with a heavy dosage of class warfare. He held Boston Yankee business leaders in contempt. He took great pleasure in aggravating them and wrenching concessions from them. He relished telling the account of how he coerced Philip Stockton, president of the First National Bank of Boston, to loan the city money to meet its payroll by threatening to open the water mains floodgates under the bank vaults. Bringing Boston's Yankees to heel was a part of Curley's appeal to his working class Irish constituency. Mayor Curley had a relationship with the black community principally through Silas Shag Taylor and his brother Balcom, who were part of his political machine operating in the black wards of the city. These African-American brothers migrated to Boston from Danville, in Virginia in the early 1920s after attending Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. By 1925, Shag was the proprietor of the Lincoln Drugstore, named after his alma mater, at 924 Tremont Street in the South End. He also operated the Pioneer Club, not far from the drugstore, an after-hours spot for socializing and political wheeling and dealing. Black newcomers to Boston from the South and the West Indies looking for jobs and housing sought out the tailors for help. Help was given after you were registered to vote and consistently voting. Thus, the Taylor brothers built a substantial electoral power base in black wards. They traded votes with Curley for jobs, housing, and city services, becoming the powerful political bosses of Ward 9. They assiduously cultivated relationships with Irish politicians and police officers by catering to their needs, providing cough medicine, quote unquote, illegal liquor during prohibition to them in the back room of the drugstore and hosting poker games on weekends in the basement of Shag's home at 1895 Beacon Street in Brookline near Cleveland Circle. I went there recently. The Taylors used their political base to become players in city, state, and national politics. They became close associates of Governor Dever, Fergalo, Governors De uh, Dever, Fergalo, and Peabody. Elwood McKinney, a bright young lawyer, became chief secretary to Governor Costa Fergalo through the advocacy of the Taylors. McKinney is one of, the, of two blacks to ever be in the inner circle of a governor of the Commonwealth. Balcom was a vice president of the Democratic City Club, member of the Democratic State Committee, and a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. The Taylors also visited with Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the White House. This was a brand of black power politics in Boston never to be seen again after they were gone. Mary, Mayor Curley presided over a city in serious economic decline with vast pockets of physical blight. As historian Thomas H. O'Connor termed it, quote, Boston had become a hopeless backwater. Nothing was being built, neither housing nor streets nor roads, end of quote. Boston was on a precipice, about to fall into an abyss. Therefore, the administration of Johns Hines marked the beginning of modern Boston as he moved to yank the city away from the precipice by seeking to physically reform it through federally subsidized urban renewal. He knew this could only be accomplished by an alliance between the city's political leadership and business community. In essence, Mayor Hines sought to build a new political culture in Boston, working to lessen the historic antagonism and tension between Catholics and Protestants. He immediately reached out to CEOs in banking, insurance, and utilities, appointing them to special committees to support and advise him on development. Hines established a new Boston committee in 1950, quote, to bring together men and women from all walks of life, from religious and racial groups in the city, all neighborhoods, and all spheres of Boston's life, end of quote. It was an effective civic mechanism 
to supersede the power of ward pol political organization, though ward politics never died. Mayor Hines circumvented Shag Taylor and the Curly Machine in the black community and brought into his political circle his own black leaders. He turned to Victor Bino, a civil engineer and officer of the Young Democrats of Massachusetts, who had been a major supporter of Hines in his campaign against Curley. Bino was appointed street commissioner, where he served as a trusted political operative in the black community. Harry and Clarence Elam, both Republicans, Edward Cooper, the director of the Urban League, and Malia Cash and Ruth Batson, leaders with the NAACP, Otto and Muriel Snowden, co-directors of Freedom House, and Reverend William Hester, pastor of the 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury, were brought into the new alignment with the black community. What these black leaders mostly shared in common was an organizational base with a membership constituency. Shag and Val Taylor traded in electoral patronage politics, while this new group traded in access broker politics as transitional political leaders. Community organizational leaders were essentially community quote unquote politicians holding sway for at least two decades until blacks gained elective office in the state house, city council, and the school committee. They filled the vacuum created by the absence of an elected black political leadership class in the 1950s. During the 1950s, some blacks described Boston as being up south. Racial discrimination and segregative practices in public agencies fueled dissatisfaction and frustration in the black community. Under the policy and management control of Irish Catholics, student assignment practices segregated black students in predominantly black schools in black neighborhoods. The achievement outcomes of students confirmed that black students were being shortchanged by systemic neglect. A very small percentage of black students were gaining admission to the elite exam high schools. The Pullman School Association, Boston's version of a PTA, was controlled and manipulated by school department officials, so parental criticisms and complaints were ignored or not tolerated. There were no black principals or headmasters, and only 30 black teachers out of a teaching force of about 3,000. Qualified black applicants for teaching positions were openly discouraged by school personnel from seeking employment. The Boston Housing Authority compounded the indignities experienced by black residents. Its segregation practices were epitomized by the Mission Hill housing projects, Mission Main and Mission Extension, also known as the Alice Taylor Homes. Parker Street separated the two housing units, where mostly black tenants occupied the former site and whites the latter. When tenants went to pay their rent, blacks lined up at one window and whites at the other. These placement policies and practices were implemented in public housing projects across the city, especially effective in keeping blacks out of the projects in South Boston, Charlestown, and East Boston. Blacks were unwelcome in the Boston Police and Fire Department. Black applicants for patrolmen and firefighter positions ran into the stone wall of civil service preference policies and questionable hiring practices. Few blacks held significant manage management positions in either department. Paul Johnson, who many of you here know, who had a stellar career as a Boston police officer and who retired as deputy superintendent in 1985, recounted this story. In 1954, he was employed as a police officer. After sitting on the eligibility, the eligible employment list for a number of years, he was assigned to the District 9 station at Roxbury Crossing. At roll call on his first day on the job, the police captain said aloud, I see that we have some smoky Irishmen on the list today. Reminding Johnson, that he was intruding on the preserve of Boston's Irish. At that time, only white patrolmen rode in cruisers. Black officers worked as foot patrolmen. 
However, some black officers could drive or work at the back of paddy wagons, sent to pick up drunks, loiterers, or persons arrested on the streets. Almost all of the 30 black officers in the late 1950s were assigned to patrol black neighborhoods. There was one black sergeant who was assigned to distribution of uniforms. In 1955, when I arrived in Boston from New York City to attend graduate school at Boston University, I was stunned by the absence of blacks in sales positions in downtown department stores. There was only one, a family friend, who worked in the glassware department at Gil Gilchrist Department Store across from Filene's and Jordan Marsh. Other black department store employees, few in number, worked out of sight in stock rooms and on receiving platforms. Working class and poor black youth faced a daunting labyrinth of restricted passages, navigating an obstacle course that they thought could lead to decent life chances. Those youth fortunate to have parents, neighbors, teachers, ministers, coaches, or youth workers to guide them could snatch a prize of limited job opportunities. A high school diploma qualified young black adults for a pool of menial jobs as manual laborers, domestic servants, shipping and stockroom workers, and in low-wage clerical and secretarial positions for females. The only escape from these dead-end jobs was to gain employment as a U.S. postal worker Pullman porter, police officer, firefighter, or government civil service worker, which provided stable income and the prospect of an adequate pension. Since many college-educated blacks were forced to accept these jobs, black high school graduates had restricted access to them. Without access to free or low-tuition public colleges and universities in the Boston area, with the exception of Boston State Teachers College, Black scholastic achievers mostly enrolled in black colleges in the South as their avenue to, to white collar jobs. The black super achievers who became doctors, lawyers, pharmacists, nurses, social workers, and engineers could only practice their professional skills in the black community outside mainstream employment sectors. Nevertheless, many working class and middle class blacks in Boston acted as though they were in a good place. It was a historic attitude nurtured by the good fortune of being free Negroes during slavery and having access to civic benefits such as education and cultural resources denied blacks in many cities in the United States, particularly in the South. After all, they lived in a historic city with a long-standing reputation for tolerance between blacks and whites. Many black achievers in education and professions knowing that they were just as accomplished, almost more so, than their white counterparts, came to be known as black Brahmins. And Adelaide Gulliver is the expert on that, and she's in the audience. Pride in their social standing and privilege, quote unquote, also shaped the attitudes and posture of the black working class. These imitators also resisted black outsiders, quote unquote, infiltrating their domain who thought that Boston-bred blacks were caught in a time warp. They were viewed as competitors for political and civic leadership positions. These outsiders were thwarted from exerting leadership unless they adhered to the ascension rituals and requirements of the black leadership establishment. Although the black community in the 1950s suffered dispro disproportionately from physical decline and social blight, its leadership was not disposed to vigorously challenge political and corporate power. The Boston branches of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and the Urban League basically adopted an advocacy posture mostly based on collaborative strategies, with only a few confrontation actions by the NAACP. Since the alliance between Mayor Hines and business leaders was focused on downtown reclamation, the infrequent pleadings of black leaders and brokers did not yield significant benefits for black Boston. For black Boston, the 1950s was the lull before the storm. The community was like a simmering pressure cooker with accumulated grievances and frustrations building up pressure. 
After John Hines left office with the city in a state of embryonic reconstruction, the top blew off the pressure cooker and the indignities and unfairness suffered by black residents would be plain for all to see or deny. When John Hines passed the mayor's baton to John F. Collins on January 4, 1960, the civil rights movement in the South had already ignited protest demonstrations by black citizens in northern cities. These social phenomena were beginning to roil the waters of black discontent in Boston. By late 1962, the Boston NAACP was conducting a study to document educational inequities for black students in the Boston public schools and the policies and practices by school officials that had resulted in segregation of students by race. Around the same time, a group of activists led by Reverend James Breeden, a Roxbury Episcopal priest, and Noel Day, executive director of the St. Mark's Social Center in Roxbury, began mobilizing black residents and white allies in the city and suburbs to execute a one-day boycott of the schools by junior high and high school students to protest against unacceptable school conditions. These two streams of activism burst into public view in the summer of 1963 igniting one of the most extraordinary racial stalemates in Boston's history. The famous school committee meeting on the evening of June 11, 1963, was the opening salvo in a four months of heated racial conflagration. Since this meeting set Boston on a race relations course from which it is still trying to recover, I will present my eyewitness account of this public meeting though abbreviated here. The room was already packed when I arrived at school committee chambers at 15 Beacon Street in downtown Boston. On that warm June evening in 1963, the school committee had gathered to hear a report by the Boston branch of the NAACP concerning the plight of black students in the Boston public schools. Seated behind a long brown table on a raised platform sat Thomas Eisenstadt, Joseph Lee, Louise Day Hicks, William O'Connor, and Arthur Gartland, school committee members who had been elected at large to represent the interests of all school children in Boston. It was Boston's version of a jury of your peers, all white. On the floor directly in front of the committee at a witness stand, quote unquote, sat Ruth Batson and Paul Parks chair and member of the NAACP's Education Committee, respectively. Batson was a housewife and a mother of three children. A Boston native, she was a staunch member of the NAACP. Short and plump, she possessed an expressive, warm, dark-skinned face that turned cold and stern when she was perturbed. Tonight was the night for her mask of outrage. Parks, an engineer who had moved to Boston from his birthplace in Indiana, had thrown himself into civil rights activities almost from the time of his arrival. They presented the NAACP's case as the school committee stoically listened. Quote, we are here because the clamor from the community is too anxious to be ignored. The dissatisfaction and complaints too genuine and deep-seated to pass over lightly. Batson began. The injustices in our school system hurt our pride, rob us of our dignity, and produce results that are injurious, not only to our future, but those of the city, the state, and the nation. She continued. In their report, Batson and Parks asserted that de facto segregation existed in the Boston public schools, and that black students assi were assigned to predominantly black, black schools and were being shortchanged by inferior conditions. They cited overcrowded schools, poor facility repair and maintenance, and an inadequate supply of books and instructional, instructional materials as evidence. They presented the NAACP's 14-point program for corrective action, first calling for public acknowledgement by the school committee that de facto segregation existed in the Boston school system. Suddenly, a large hulk of a woman named Louise Day Hicks, 
the chairwoman of the school committee spoke. This was the first time I had seen her in action. Mrs. Batson, surely you do not believe that this committee has any responsibility for housing patterns in this city, Mrs. Hicks intoned in her squeaky, high-pitched voice. This is beyond our control. We assign children to schools nearest to their homes. We reject the charge that this committee has deliberately segregated students in our school system based on race, end of quote. Various school committee members joined the rebuttal to fully and enthusiastically support Mrs. Hicks' position, with the exception of Arthur Gartland. Moderate to progressive by persuasion, Gartland agreed that it was proper to admit that de facto segregation existed, but through no fault of the school, of school system action. His other colleagues would have none of this accommodation, for he was out on a political limb as the only voice of reason. By the time the other four committee members had finished their orations, mainly designed for media consumption, it was clear that the jury had arrived at a verdict before the NAACP's case was barely presented. There were many white and black Bostonians who claimed that the school committee could see the problem, but was playing dumb in order to perpetuate the miserable status quo. Others would maintain that the committee had set a trap for the NAACP, and its leaders walked into it with their eyes wide open, not recognizing that the committee wanted a racial confrontation to advance their political aspirations and increase bonding with their white constituents. The postmortems were endless. Clearly, June 11, 1963, was a watershed for Black Boston. The top was about to blow off the community pressure cooker as blacks and whites became locked in a volatile stalemate. Through the next four months, black leaders and white school officials punched and counterpunched at each other over the desegregation charge. The first punch from black leaders was to stay out for freedom on June 18, 1963, which resulted in 3,000 junior high and high school students boycotting school for the day. Most of these students attended freedom schools, conducted in churches and community centers within the black community, where they were exposed to black history and the purposes of the civil rights movement. The Massachusetts Committee for Human Rights and the Boston NAACP endorsed the boycott, mostly organized and executed by the former organization. Frenetic efforts by Governor Endicott Peabody and the state's first attorney, black attorney general Edward W. Brooke to negotiate a resolution to the standoff and avert the boycott came to naught. Despite threats by school and judicial officials to fine and imprison boycott leaders, black leaders faced down the threats and acted. The success of the school stay out toughened the resolve of black leadership and signaled that a long, hard struggle lie ahead. The second punch came on June 26, 1963, when I and Mel King, then director of the South End House, executed Stop Day, a one-day general strike in Boston to protest all forms of racial discrimination. The Stop organization, an ad hoc group of activists, called on blacks and their white allies to stay out of work, stop buying, and riding the MD MTA for one day. Although the established black leadership led by the NAACP objected to the general strike tactic, the idea caught on in the black community, and ordinary people started talking about staying out of work on June 26. This groundswell struck terror in the downtown business community, and Attorney General Edward Brooke was called upon by business leaders to work to head it off. The NAACP attempted to undermine the effectiveness of the general strike by quickly organizing a memorial service on stop day for Medgar Evans, the NAACP leader who had been slain in Jackson, Mississippi on June 12th, an event that shocked the nation. 1,000 people who responded to stop <coughs> marched from Carter Playground in Lower Roxbury down Columbus Avenue to the Boston Common to attend the memorial service. As we marched, residents along the route hung out of windows, clapped, and shouted encouragement. Some ran out of their apartment buildings, 
or from the sidewalks to join the march. When we marched onto the site at the Parkman Bandstand, the thousands already assembled for the memorial service stood up and cheered to the chagrin of the established black leadership. The stop campaign was my first experience in learning what happens to newcomer activists who attempt to lead without being anointed by established black leaders and who avoid the ascension rituals in black Boston. Starting on the morning of June 29th, protests at school committee headquarters were kicked off when a group of mostly white demonstrators appeared shortly before 9 a.m. Six of the pickets locked arms, forming a human chain across the front entrance, while others sat on the staircase and in two elevators inside the building. 100 persons were kept from their work for one hour. This was an effort to get the school committee to negotiate with the NAACP. However, the committee was infuriated and toughened, toughened its resistance to demands. On August 1st, the NAACP turned its fire on Mayor John Collins for not fulfilling what they said was his moral responsibility in the dispute between the NAACP and the school committee. Indeed, Collins, who was focusing on physical rebuilding of the city with the support of Ed Logue, his, chief, his development chief, had stood apart from the stalemate up until that time. Through much of August and into September, the punching and counter-punching was fierce. Black leaders supported by whites launched one demonstration after the other at 15 Beacon Street. On the evening of September 5th, the NAACP staged a sit-in at the building. Eight demonstrators, five blacks and three whites, including two women, stayed in the building all night while outside pickets marched and sang freedom songs. The eight were alone inside the building except for a group of newsmen and a half dozen police officers. Baskets, baskets lowered on belts and nylon stockings, their improvised rope, were used to raise food to the demonstrators. This siege lasted for two days until a bomb scare forced evacuation of the building. Out of all this conflagration came the school committee's new open enrollment policy that would list available seats in schools throughout the city. Parents could then seek to transfer their children using these openings. However, parents would have to provide their own transportation if needed. A Boston Globe analysis at that time revealed 13,196 empty seats. School committee members claimed that they were shocked by this revelation. In September, the NAAC proposed a plan to redraw district lines in only a half dozen school clusters to reduce racial imbalance. No bus transportation of pupils would be required. It would have allowed for a reassignment of pupils in 16 predominantly black schools. The end result would have been not a single school in the city would have a majority of black children. Louise Day Hicks and her committee colleagues, with the exception of Gartland, rejected the proposal, claiming it was gerrymandering that was in violation of the U.S. Constitution. Fourteen religious and civic leaders made a public appeal to the school committee to consider the proposal. It changed not a thing as the city headed toward a primary day election on September 24th. The primary voting results were devastating to black Boston and fair-minded whites. All five school committee incumbents were renominated, but three of the four who refused to recognize de facto segregation were given commanding victories, totals higher than the mayor. Mrs. Hicks polled 78,205 votes, 21,000 more than Mayor Collins, who was a substantial winner in his race. These results were sustained in the general November election. At the end of September, the school committee, by a three to two vote, hired Deputy Superintendent William H. Orenberger to be the new superintendent. This occurred after a search process led by Dr. Dr. Harold Hunt of Harvard University, whose involvement gave initial hope that an outsider, quote unquote, of national standing might be hired. It was not to be. The Boston public schools were doomed, were now doomed to more years of mediocrity or worse.
the hope that the school committee would hire a bona fide educational manager who would probably move to dismantle their patronage hiring practices and their control of contracts led for goods and services was indeed naive. As protest act action continued through 1963 and culminated with a second school stay out on February 26, 1964, black leadership began to disengage from its direct pitch battles with a defiant school committee. They decided that it was a no-win proposition that only increased the political fortunes of their white opponents. Black leaders then pursued alternative strategies that disengaged them from standoffs with school officials. First in 1965 came Operation Exodus, led by Ellen Jackson, a program that privately bused black students to open seats in predominantly white schools in Boston, taking advantage of the new open enrollment policy. In 1966 came METCO, the Metropolitan Council for Educational Opportunity, an alliance between white suburban and black Boston leaders that resulted in the transportation of 400 black students to seats in seven suburban schools. METCO was built on the racial imbalance. Now, excuse me, now over 3,100 black students are enrolled in 32 suburban school systems. METCO was built on the racial imbalance law passed in 1965 through white black coalition politics. Then there was the creation of an experimental school district that created a high school for Boston black and white suburban students, one of the few attempts at a metropolitan solution. Although black leadership sought to change the Boston schools by capturing seats on the school committee, which occurred with John D. O'Brien elected in 1977 and Gene McGuire, executive director of METCO, elected in 1981, black leaders of the 1960s had disinvested in direct school reform work. A state of hopelessness and fatigue had set in that was underscored by a judgment that only chronic incremental reform at best was possible in the Boston public schools. They came to learn that entrenched racism was deep in the muscles of a politicized bureaucracy, impervious to radical transformation, which was the only thing that would provide excellent education for children of color. This unrecognized divestment by prominent black leadership was camouflaged by continuing parental and civic advocacy in search of school reform. However, the full force of a united, disciplined black leadership focused on school reform, in my judgment, has been absent for over 35 years. Mayor Collins's main relationship with the black community during the 1960s was through his alliance with Freedom House, a civic center founded by Otto and Muriel Snowden in Roxbury near Grove Hall in 1949. These black leaders epitomized access politics based on community organization, not on a voter power base. The Snowdens immediately fashioned an alliance with Collins and Lowe to execute their plans for renewal in Washington Park a 186-acre section of Roxbury. Collins was pursuing a single-minded city rebuilding agenda, and he chose not to be diverted by the tumult building in the streets. He made his commitment to black Boston through embracing and executing renewal in Washington Park. It would have to suffice, for he had solidarity with the black leaders that he believed mattered most, ministers and institutional leaders in Freedom House's orbit and some black business people. As Mayor Collins neared the end of his last term, he and business leaders were stunned by the violent rebellion in Roxbury which erupted on the evening of June 2, 1967, growing out of police assaults on demonstrators at a sit-in by Mothers for Adequate Welfare at the welfare office in Grove Hall. For at least four days, the area between Grove Hall and Dudley Street was a war zone. Stores owned by Jewish merchants were vandalized, looted, and set, abra set ablaze. A guerrilla war ensued as the police responded in kind to gunfire coming to them from rooftops. Police swept through the Blue Hill Avenue Strip, a 15-block area north of Grove Hall, and aggressively grabbed anyone on the streets and arrested them. 
including Byron Rushing, then working for the Massachusetts Council of Churches, now our state representative, and Tom Atkins from the NAACP, who had just returned from a meeting with Mayor Collins. The physical devastation that resulted was the beginning of turning the strip into a quasi-desolated area. During 1964 and 1965, there were major riots or rebellions in black communities in 63 cities across the nation. The largest ones in Watts, the Watts section of LA, Newark, and Detroit. Boston's political and civic leaders hoped that their city could be spared this fate because of the plethora of service organizations, community development programs, and advocacy groups that had been engaged in corrupt, corrupt, uh, constructive work since the early 1960s. Many of these service organizations had been spawned by funds from the U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity and HUD's Model Cities Program. This false hope was a gross misreading of the depth of anger, frustration, and despair stewing in black Boston. The disastrous transformation of the Strip became complete in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. on April 4, 1968. Immediately after Dr. King's death was announced on television, I was at home, I was called at home and informed that a community meeting would be held at the Blue Hill Christian Center on Blue Hill Avenue, one block from the Roxbury Multi-Service Center, where I was serving as executive director. When I arrived, there was assembled a large group dominated by teenagers and young adults. Reverend Virgil Woods, the director of the center, was making an impassioned appeal that we not allow our rage and pain to be turned into actions that would further damage the community. Suddenly, a group of, young, of youth jumped up and pro proclaimed that they had heard enough and that they were going to go downtown and take care of business. They raced out of the center, jumped into their cars, and with their wheels screeching, headed for Boston's commercial core. I hurried to the Roxbury Multi-Service Center to open, open it for community use and called my staff to come in and prepare for the worst. Within 15 minutes, I heard plate glass shattering as the remaining commercial enterprises owned by whites on the strip were vandalized, looted, and burned. When the youth who had sped toward downtown reached Massachusetts Avenue, they met a blue steel curtain of Boston police in riot gear, set in place to prevent passage out of the black community. A ring of police protection had also been placed around major department stores. So these young people turned around, returned to Blue Hill Avenue, and vented their rage within the black community. The same police and firefighters' super preparedness to protect the commercial core was not evidence with respect to the black community. The police and fire departments waited until rioters' behavior and fires were out of control and great damage to physical property had already been done. Then they entered the affected area in brutal mop-up mode with the police in a posture of take no prisoners. After the violence ended and community life returned to normalcy, abandoned, boarded up, house stores littered the strip, and eventually most social service and advocacy organizations left as well. City officials with the power to rebuild the area chose other parts of the city in which to invest. However, the climate of inattention to the needs and plight of black residents changed to a climate of quasi-attention, which is always short-lived. A few for-profit and not-for-profit entrepreneurs got access to funding not previously available to them. There were limited responses by city and state officialdom to demands from the NAACP and the Black United Front, a new organization, to redress specific grievances. In 1967, Louise Day Hicks ran for mayor and lost to Kevin H. White. Thomas Atkins was elected as the first black at-large city councilor with the support of a formidable black-white coalition. These results reveal the first crack in racist politics in Boston. For all of the pain and defeats experienced by blacks during the 1960s, it was an era of great energy, creativity, and optimism. Black leadership was assertive, 
having forsaken sacred its accommodation is passed. Collaboration and collective action superseded the usual go it alone organizational behavior within the black community. The gulf between the black church and black social institutional leaders narrowed. A new generation of black leaders were rising to, challenges to pra challenge the practices of the old guard and enrich our leadership ranks. The organizational infrastructure became broader and deeper, providing a stronger platform for political and economic development as we moved into the 1970s. Now, last night I brutally cut, cut the, the, the next three decades, so don't worry, you're not going to be here all night. <laughs> Race relations in the 1970s was defined by the aftermath of the federal court's decision on June 21st, 1974, to desegregate the Boston public schools. During the 1971-72 school year, black parents filed suit in federal court with the support of the NAACP. The federal court documented gerrymandering of district lines to create school zones, transfer policies, feeder systems, school construction decisions, use of mobile classrooms, and inequitable distribution of teaching resources. All these policies and practices work to maintain segregation of the races to the disadvantage of black students. Judge Garrity ordered a busing remedy to desegregate the schools. On September 12, 1974, the first day when buses filled with black students rolled into South Boston, angry white mobs stoned the buses and hurled racial epithets at these, at these students as they scurried into the school. Black leaders met with Mayor White at City Hall that late that afternoon and insisted that he attend a community meeting with black parents at Freedom House that evening. Percy Wilson, executive director of the Roxbury Multi-Service Center, my successor, voiced the group's disappointment and outrage about the inability of the police to exercise crowd control and prevent black students from being set upon. Wilson wondered aloud whether the mayor really cared about the safety of black children. A perturbed white caustically rebutted the charge. However, he agreed to speak to parents at the meeting that night. He found an overflowing, agitated crowd waiting to hear that safety would be guaranteed for their children the next day. Mayor White admitted lapses in police protection and pleaded for a second chance. He quickly left the meeting unscathed but visibly shaken. The racial conflagration sparked by the federal court order was shocking but predictable. As descendants of immigrants who were subjected to harsh forms of discrimination at every turn in Boston, Irish Catholics abhorred higher author authorities' penchant for eroding their rights, opportunities, and gains. They had achieved political and other standing through inch-by-inch -inch trench warfare and fierce in-group loyalty and patronage. When they felt that their way of life or rights were threatened or under siege, the Irish were trained, quote unquote, to give no ground. And when they advanced against the opposition, to take no prisoners. It came to re be revealed in 1974 in the streets and in the corridors of political power. Starting in the mid 1970s, the Catholic school system in Greater Boston expanded rapidly and took in the fleeing white students, even though then Cardinal Medeiros claimed that he would not allow his parochial schools to be used as a haven to avoid the segregation remedies. Ironically, the parochial schools struggling with declining enrollments at that time were saved by the federal court order. Also, movement of white families into cities and towns, mostly south of Boston, to access public schools there aided the flight phenomenon. Boston Irish leaders, as well as black leaders, disinvested from the Boston public schools after the federal court decision. No amount of reform efforts, installation of two black superintendents, large Annenberg grants, or endless restructuring of the system can paper over the hard truth that both black and white leaders are half-stepping, if stepping at all, regarding radical reform of the Boston schools. Consequently, students and parents of color who have no other viable options for their children are left in an awful state of limbo as the MCAS battering ram bludgeons them, 
mercilessly. There is no evidence that school officials and civic leaders really care about our lost children, those students so devastated by MCAS failure that they quit school and drop into social oblivion. The battles and standoffs of the 1960s and the 1970s have evolved into a new form of racial coexistence and segregation. In sum, relative to the Boston Public Schools since the 1960s, a lot has changed, but nothing has changed. Relations in the decade Race relations in the decade of the 1980s was defined by the black community's relations with the Boston police. It cannot be overstated that police attitudes and conduct play a large role in shaping race relations in this city, in any city. As the ultimate authority equipped with a de deadly weapon, the police are either viewed as symbols of protection or oppression, in some cases both. When events cause adversarial relationships between the police, who are mostly white, and black residents, the racial climate is poisoned and the movement of blacks around the city becomes narrower and more uncomfortable based on fear. Black people are then put on guard, watching out for behaviors of all whites that might be harm harmful to them. Once the spiral of caution and fright is present, the police unwittingly send covert messages to whites to be on guard in relations with black people who they do not know. Latent racism gets activated and distrust on both sides escalate. In short, the police are one of the unrecognized regulators of relations between the races. From this perspective, public safety, the public safety crisis in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, which emerged in the mid-1980s, defined much of race relations in Boston for that decade. First, drug parties and youth street gangs unleashed street violence. Drive-by shootings and killings created a state of alarm and fear throughout the black community. Second, on August 19, 1988, Darlene Tiffany Moore, an 11-year-old sitting on a mailbox, was killed by a stray bullet. This was a wake-up call that sent the, black, the, the Boston police into intensive crackdown mode. Police Commissioner Mickey Roach, supported by Mayor Ray Flynn, adopted a search on site policy, a search on site or stop and frisk policy, which permitted black residents to be stopped and frisked by police if, even if they had no evidence that they had committed a crime. Young black men were targeted, but older adults as well. In many cases, those who were stopped were ordered into a spread eagle stance, forced to drop their trousers and underpants, and strip search in public view. Then there was Attorney General Shannon saying that this, was, this, this policy was not, a, a, not such a policy, which created a, a, a stir. Then came the Charles Stewart fiasco. You remember the Charles Stewart fiasco, uh, where, where a white suburbanite stuck at white leaders and police into believing that a black mugger had come and his car and killed a, his pregnant wife, which set off a firestorm around the rampaging in Mission Hill. Then there was the Roxbury, Greater Roxbury Incorporation Project, known as GRIP, a movement by some black leaders to have the areas of Roxbury and Mattapan and parts of Dorchester, Jamaica Plain, the Fenway and Columbia Point and, and the South End secede from Boston. Finally, there was the stabbing of a young mourner at a funeral at the Morgan, Morning Star Baptist Church in Mattapan by four black gang members. The general belief that the church was inviolable and a safe haven was stripped away. And this is the event that led to the formation of the Ten Point Coalition, a black, -led, a black clergy led organization that sent ministers into the streets to work with youth in or attracted to gangs. And finally, the 1990s was defined by a demographic revolution that created a quote unquote majority minority city by the beginning of the 21st century. The in-migration of Haitians, Africans, Southeast Asians, Central Americans, Brazilians, Cubans, Dominicans, and Cape Verdeans has changed the racial and ethnic character of Boston neighborhoods. Gone are the tight racial enclaves and ethnic enclaves of the 1950s and 1960s. Neighborhood boundaries are now more permeable with healthier social transactions between residents in different neighborhoods. 
Gentrification, a two-edged sword, is, is rampant in most neighborhoods where numbers of middle and upper class professionals are taking hold and squeezing out the poor and working class. This phenomenon in Charlestown and South Boston is transforming those neighborhoods and should eventually place its traditional xenophobia and racial chauvinism on its deathbed. Although housing discrimination and segregation is still a, a painful reality, greater tolerance and acceptance of diversity exist in Boston than at any time in our previous history. Boston may tolerate diversity. Bostonians may tolerate diversity, but they do not yet celebrate diversity as compared to other cities like San Francisco. Social relations are now very complex in Boston because racial and ethnic groups must cope with the cultural differences within their groups. Internal integration as a prerequisite to true social integration across racial and ethnic lines is now a big civic challenge. Well into the 1990s, black Boston still suffered from the absence of strong political leadership. In spite of numerical dominance in the city, black leaders are few and exert little power. There is no black congressional representative, no black mayor, one black state senator, only four black state representatives for Boston, and two city councilors out of 13. A handful of black ministers have more political influence than our elected black, uh, black officials. There have been few blacks in the inner circle of mayors or governors exercising influence on behalf of the broad black community. White people in power, in my judgment, are not compelled to consult with our political leaders or care or worry about what black Boston thinks or wants. The build-out in South Boston Seaport District is the latest example of the black community's marginalization. We are about to see a replay of how the big dig, $14 billion and still counting, left black Boston on the sidelines. This condition is primarily due to low voter registration and voting behavior in the black community. Political disempowerment could be, could, could be used to dismantle this, 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 uh, this, this uh, reality, using the new demographics to ramp up voter registration and voting. I left on your seat so I don't have to read it, the fact that there is some good news and positive signs in Boston. Uh, and I just think that, that, that there, is, there are a lot of things going on. So if there is good news, then why do we have this nagging feeling that Bostonians are still wandering around in the wilderness when it comes to race? There are at least two reasons. First, the invisibility of black people at public events, social clubs, recreational venues, and in the public life of the city is sadly a civic norm. It speaks to a social segregation that is intolerable. For me, it is infuriating. It is a part of the collective denial by white Bostonians that black residents are marginalized and are on the outside looking in on the good fortune of others. Second, racism is structural. The schooling, housing, law enforcement, government, and media structures carry out policies and practices that restrict viable choices for blacks. Time does not permit me to elaborate here. Suffice it to say, Boston's racial conundrum will continue until people of color in Boston have the access and power required to dismantle structural racism. I have lived and worked in the Boston area for 45 years. I have done so because of the incredible intellectual, cultural, financial, and human resources that exist here. I love Boston with a love that's full of ambivalence. Simply put, I have a lover's quarrel with Boston. I want my adopted city to live up to its abolitionist history and progressive pronouncements. To this end, I will continue to work, and I urge you to work to make this city whole. Thank you very much.
important part of the program, a dialogue. So let's, let's see what you have on your mind. Yes, sir. Brother Hennessy. How was the liquor? <laughs> Well, I think the good news uh, in Boston is we have a very deep and broad nonprofit service sector, probably broader and deeper than in any other city in the country of our size. Uh, it is, it, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's partially a result of what happened uh, in, the, in the 60s. Uh, and there are just a lot of very good people who are working day in and day out at a grassroots level uh, trying to uh, build a better build a better Boston and build better opportunities for folks. Uh, you, you've got to have uh, the officials who are in power to do their job uh, and to make uh, it possible for folks to have access to resources and opportunities that that they need. Uh, when you come right down to it, a city really never moves unless the center of the city, that is the city government, in collaboration with community leadership, are on the same page and are working to make substantial change. Now, one of the themes of my book, and uh, which I'll have to prove, is that uh, black Bostonians are interesting. Uh, they think they're in a good place. And, are doing, and they think they're doing well. Uh, and uh, compared to what's going on in other cities in the country, they are not. Uh, other cities like New York and Cleveland and San Francisco and Philadelphia and so forth have had their black mayors, Atlanta. And these black mayors, using their office and their political resources, have been able to forge greater substantial progress, economic progress, uh, for folks of color in the city. Uh, we have not gotten there yet, and we have to get there. We have an interesting young man who is uh, sitting in the, I think that's Ron Bell back there. Is that Ron Bell? Okay. Named Ron Bell, who runs an organization called Dunk for Vote, who works with another organization called Boston Vote, and they're not, and they're not playing. They are doing voter registration week in, week out, month in, month out, 
and we're, be, and, we get, and we're getting beyond the episodic voter registration stuff that has been historic in the Boston black community. We've always got, had voter registration flurries around election time and around candidates, but no sustained building a voter base. A dunk the vote and, and Boston vote in collaboration with black ministers got 33% more folks voting in the last November election. It's a very, very hopeful sign. Anybody who saw me on Channel 7 last Sunday knows my thing is you got to vote. I gave a speech like this uh, to a group of people recently, and somebody said to me, wait a minute, oh, so what's the bottom line about all this stuff? Is the bottom line in Boston that for black folks to get serious attention and recognition and so forth, you have to either riot or vote. Is that it? I said, yeah, I think that's the bottom line. Okay? Now, we tried the riot route, and I don't think we got too far with the riot route. Okay, uh, now we've got to go, I think, the voting route. Uh, that, that's no silver bullet. That's also illusory. Okay, that's also illusory, but we've got to pursue it. We've got to pursue it. So there are young folks, I'm just thrilled by the young folks like uh, Ron Bell and uh, Tito, and, I mean, just, uh, who are just out there working at this stuff day in and day out. And we've got to build a base. If 85% of of the potential voters in Boston were registered to vote, the mayor wouldn't do half the things he's currently doing. Okay? You just have to be a potential voter. At one meeting I was with, uh, uh, the minister of Ron Bell's church said that he started talking voter registration in his church and got serious about it, and all of a sudden some city officials were on his front steps saying, can we fix your, can we fix your front walk? I mean, <laughs> is, is, is there anything we can do for you? Is there anything you can do, we can do for you? Uh, so that's, I think that's a piece of it. Uh, I'm not suggesting anything's a silver bullet. Uh, but th the bottom line is we have got to get together young people, old folks like me who can pass on a little wisdom and try to figure out strategies to, uh, you know, to, make, uh, to, to make a better city for everybody. For everybody. Yes, sir. Big problem. It's a big problem. It's a big problem for, for you know. It's a big problem across the board. We have a situation where very talented, competent young people, and some are in this room, uh, who we need to run for elected office, don't want to get anywhere near it. They'll tell you straight to your face. Politics is messy. I just want to do my work. I don't want to get in fights with people. I just want to run my office. I just want to build my organization. I see Alan Casey back there. I remember a night, a night from the city. I remember a night we had a group of 27 young black leaders together, and I said, I got a problem with you folks. It's fabulous. You do extraordinary work. In fact, we have some of the most extraordinary social entrepreneurs young, in, in, in the city. They do fabulous work, you know? And uh, I said to them, but I got a problem. You know, you folks are divorced from politics. You're divorced from policy making in the city. You got, you're the future leaders of this city. And most of them said, hey, we don't, we don't even want to get near that stuff. Okay? And it's true for the white community as well. I mean, for white, you know, we, we, we just are not getting in this country. Just look at the presidential candidates. <laughs> Democratic Party has, I don't know, how many they got now? Ten? All right, ten? You know, and isn't it kind of weird that, I find it weird for myself, that I suddenly get excited by listening for 15 minutes to Wesley Clark the other day. I got very excited. I said, this is the only guy I hear, I hear coming out of nowhere who's, 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 talking, who's talking turkey. I hope, he runs, I hope he runs. Okay? Now, I don't know where he is on black folks. I don't know where he is on, on, on community development. I don't know where he is on domestic policy yet. Obviously, we'll have to find out. But we just don't have uh, a serious elected political class, okay, in this country at a national level, at a state level, as well as at a, at a you know, so, so it's, it's a challenge. You know, we've, uh, we've just got to get people to, to do it, step up and do it. 
Yes. Well, first of all, I think we should, uh, you know, I mean, I've made a lot of cracks at the media both during my time here. And I've had lots of criticism about the media. But we first want to recognize that Boston has a very powerful, public-spirited media, like few other cities in the country. Okay? Uh, WGBH is just taping us. Uh, most Bostonians don't know that it is one of the most powerful uh, media outlets in public television. Okay? Uh, it's a treasure. Very important. Uh, and does very important work with the, the documentaries and so forth that they that they that they they they, uh, they they've done. Uh, I can't knock the Boston Globe this this uh, you know this this year. I think they did a hell of a job on the Catholic Church. <laughs> you know, I think they did a hell of a public service. Courageous, necessary, important. Uh, that's what journalism ought to be about. I'm not against the Catholic Church. Don't get me wrong, anyway. Okay, but. What was going on had to be dealt with and had to be uncovered. Uh, so we do have the possibility of uh, a media being made to pay attention. But you've got to make them pay attention. You know, you've got to make them pay attention. Uh, and it's possible to make them pay attention. I used to teach a course on that. I won't, I won't do that tonight. Okay. But uh, and I've had, I've had, I've had, Interesting media people come to advocacy courses I've taught uh, from the Herald, the Globe, and other places. And what they usually come come and do is that they would, you know, jump on the class and say, you know, you folks never come to us. You, you folks never do this. You never you never engage with us. You never do this. It's, you know, we never use us. Da 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 da. Now, I used to get a little upset with them because they had a responsibility to, to reach out and do certain things. But the, it is also true that we are not systematically systematically using the media uh, to convey messages, to shape public opinion, and all of the rest. Uh, it's, it's quite important. I didn't spend 20 years on 5 on 5 because I liked getting up every Sunday morning, whatever it was, fighting with Army Nelson. I mean, that was, not my, that was not my cup of tea. But it's important to have a public voice. Okay? The problem with Boston right now, right now is that few people have their public and private voice one and the same. Okay? Because folks are afraid of being a retribution. Right? Uh, they, just won't they, they just won't tell it like it is. And if your public and, if your pu public and private voice can't be one and the same, then you've got to begin to worry about your integrity and where we can go. If we can go anywhere. That was the, great, the greatest lesson from Dr. Martin Luther King was that, that your private and public voice has to be one and the same. And you remember his misgivings about the war in Vietnam and very upset about it. What, but the black civil rights leaders were telling him, don't, don't say anything. It will be an awful backlash against the civil rights movement. You're going to make Lyndon Baines Johnson mad and he's going to take away stuff we're getting from them. Well, he... He finally went to Riverside Church in, in April 1967 and declared he was opposed to the war in Vietnam. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's a challenge for all of us. Okay, we have some political figures in the city who are vindictive. You, you say things they don't like, they, they try to hurt you. There are a few who try to get you, have your job taken. I won't name many, many names, but that's what goes on. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, I think that's like a soft curveball because sitting in the front row before you, my former boss, Sherry Penny, the former chancellor at UMass Boston. And all of you should know that Sherry Penny is using her life right now to, 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 to train and educate a new generation of diverse leaders in Boston through the Emerging Leaders Program. 
Last year, she had 30 diverse young leaders in a, tr in a de leadership development program. Uh, and this year, she has 39. And next year, she's going to have 40. And she's determined to build a cadre of young, talented, diverse, not only diverse by race and ethnicity and social class, but diverse in terms of fields of practice, from corporations, nonprofit organizations, church groups, you name it. Uh, and I think that's a responsibility of a university. Okay? And I, I applaud Sherry for doing that because we would go on these city to city trips and starting in Atlanta in 97 and we'd say, we don't have any young people here. We're not doing anything about bringing young people into the leadership circles of the city. You know, and we'd say that and do nothing. And she ultimately, five years later, said, I'm tired of that. Let's have a program. And we're getting, she's getting very good corporate support and foundation support uh, to uh, make it uh, as healthy and robust as possible. We have got to train young leaders together, okay? Uh, in my book, I'm going to spend uh, a, a, a good piece of time on Nell King's Rainbow Coalition days in the 1980s because I do think there are a lot of things to learn for what Mel King did because now we have a situation where we have to have the kind of multicultural politics that he was pursuing and trying to develop in a very participatory, community-based way. Uh, I think there's some lessons there uh, uh, that need to, be, need to be looked at because we now have a chance to bring this diverse community together to build a new city. And uh, it will only not happen if we allow uh, you know, Latinos to be split off from African Americans and African Americans to be split off from, from Haitians. I'll tell you one of the things, that's, one of the things that's, that's brewing in Boston is that the Haitian community is not playing around. Okay? They're serious. Uh, they have uh, black churches everywhere in the Roxbury Mattapan area. They have selectively settled on sites Okay, and it's not only about the church, it's also about the economic activity that will build around that church. So you look up in 10 years, all of these circles that the, Latin, that the Haitian community is building are all gonna come together. And possibly African Americans will be up saying, well, what are these people doing? I mean, what, what, are, what, what is this? What's going on here, okay? Uh, how many of you read the Haitian Reporter? Any of, you, any of you read The Haitian Reporter? Very good newspaper. It is the Haitian community's vehicle for economic and political empowerment. They've got a vehicle. They've got their first state representative. It's the tip of the iceberg about what's coming with the Haitian community. God bless them. Okay? Uh, so... Uh, so we have these integration challenges, okay, within the black community. In 1965, when I ran the Roxbury Multi Service Center, 90% of the black community was African American. Today it's Haitian. It's Africans of all kinds. It's, Lati it's, Lati it's black Latinos. It's uh, Cape Verdeans. Uh, very different. And it requires some very smart, strategic ways to keep us together, to keep us bonded, and doing collective action together. I sat on a panel with a man who does community, de community development in Mattapan, and he was talking about the African Americans who were upset about, I forgot what group it was, maybe it was Haitians, who, uh, who were raising roosters in their yard. I mean, it was a cultural thing. You know, they were, they were raising roosters and da 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 da, and of course their neighbors didn't like it. Okay, and it was about to be a, a mad scene. Okay? It's just an example of cultural dissidence. And the challenges that we now have to bring these cultural differences together in a way that you can enrich our learning and our understanding. Okay, but we've got to have a pro we've got to programmatically do it. Otherwise, we're going to just be divided and not you know, take, you know, taking care of political business. Finally, let, let me say this: this is probably the best time to be living in Boston. 
Okay, I've been here 46 years. Okay? There are just enormous opportunities out here. Okay? That could be used to advance where everybody needs to go, but particularly people of color and, and, and poor folks. A city never has a chance, really, to move minority entrepreneurs to a new level that's serious unless they have major development projects that they can use to do that. Okay? Uh, that's what Maynard Jackson showed us in Atlanta. You remember that? Maynard Jackson, when he was mayor of Atlanta, was rebuilding the airport in Atlanta. And he decided he was going to use this public development opportunity to cut folks in who were usually not cut in. You may not know that 60% of the concessions at the Atlanta airport are minority owned. Do you know that? Like an all the airport in the world. Okay? And the people who helped build the airport, the construction people, the Herman Russells and all, you know, got a real serious piece of the action. Right? Uh, and it's a tremendous legacy that Maynard Jackson left. Now, when Maynard Jackson left office after his two terms, you know, term limits in Atlanta, he left office. The white community was so furious at him for having cut these folks in, he couldn't get a job in Atlanta. He wanted to, he wanted to do bond, legal bond work in Atlanta, and they wouldn't give him a job. They, 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 they just cut him out. Downtown folks wouldn't, wouldn't give him a job. And I met in fact, I had breakfast with him during that period, and he was going back and forth from Chicago to Atlanta to do bond work. Okay? Uh, so there's a price you pay. He probably knew it, but probably was also stunned. Okay? You see, Boston has basically, and, it has, and this is true probably for most cities, has two cycles of opportunity that are very important and shouldn't be missed and basically we're missing them. One is the cycles of large-scale development projects, okay, which give you a chance to, to move things in, in substantial ways, okay? The big dig, we missed it. We're about ready to miss the South Boston Seaport District. Maybe we won't miss the Democratic National Convention. Maybe we won't although that's not as big as the Seaport District and, and, and the other things, which are really serious, big development stuff, lots of money involved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got to be prepared and ready for when the development cycle gets to the point where you can have something to, to, to deal with. Uh, and the other cycle of opportunity is the redistricting that takes place every 10 years after the census. Okay? And you have to have your political actors in place with enough clout and, and, and smarts and everything else so that you can use the redistricting process to, to, to build voting districts that give you a chance of having elected officials prevail. So what do we have now? We have Thomas Finneran, who used his power as Speaker of the House to make his district in Mattapan whiter. You used to see that? You all aware of that? Okay. By what's he? I think he's uh, annexing it with uh, Milton. But somebody should tell him. There are a lot of well, black folks in Milton. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so, uh, and so that's what's happening. In fact, I'm going to be a, a so-called expert witness in the in the in the in the, uh, in the legal case to challenge the redistricting thing this summer. Okay. The last thing I need to do. But this thing is so outrageous. Uh, so you've got to be prepared to use the redistricting cycle to advance. Now, we did it once. Very smart, very strategic, and, and, and with a lot of determination, which gave us a district for a black senator. You remember that? That, whole, that was probably the only time I remember really going at this thing and getting some results that ended up with having at least the possibility of having one black state senator. Uh, so it's these cycles that uh, you've got to be ready to you've got to be ready to uh, to, uh, to access and, and use. I want 
final question, no?